camera, hello. All right, guys, welcome to your first class of actual freakout. Now that we've finished the Algebra 2 review, we're going to start with just talking about, well, some vocab. Some of these words you should definitely recognize from geometry, including ray and angle. And we're going to kind of jump into some more stuff. You should also know positive versus negative rotation, but we'll talk about that before we move on. <clears throat> but let's start back with just some of the more basic items. A ray has a defined starting point, right? It originates from there. There's nothing in the opposite direction from it. And it continues on forever. So what distinguishes a ray from a line is a line continues in both directions forever. Versus a line segment, which we'll also use in this class. But for now, we are going to start with everything being based in rays. So remember, a line goes in both directions forever, whereas a line segment has a terminal and starting point, right, that are defined. There is a length to this. These we can't measure, the ray or the line, because they continue forever, so there is no way to measure them. In geometry, we focus mostly on line segments because they're easier to talk about in the real world, but we're a lot more conceptual in this class, so rays are where we're starting. And very quickly, we're going straight into where we left off in my geometry class in chapter eight, where we were introduced to trigonometry. But let's talk about the definition of our angle here. An angle is formed when two rays share the same initial point. When I say initial point, that's just where the ray originates from. So I can have, we'll define P as our initial point for our ray. And from P, we can extend this ray, let's call it P to A. And we can have a second ray also originating at P to B. So now I can say that ray P, B, and ray P, A, form the angle, and I can do this in either way, and they're equivalent, B, P, A, or A, P, B. I'm gonna go B, P, A. Makes me think of plastic. Angle B, P, A, or let's just go do both. It's congruent to angle A, P, B. What is most important here is that your letter or your point at the vertex is in the middle for both of these. This says start at B, go to P, go to A. This says start at A, go to P, then B. Those both create angles. So it takes two rays who share an originating point, which is P in this case, to create these angles. Now that's where we stopped in geometry. We don't get to stop in pre-calc with that. There's a lot more stuff to know, like what's our initial side? What is our terminal sign? What's our standard position? Before we do that though, let's talk about something slightly interesting. Uh, let's see, so we have PA in green. So I'm gonna use this here. And you can see I have ray PB and ray PA, and they make these angles. So I'm going to, to talk about initial side. I'm going to say that ray PB is given, and it's telling me to create angle BPA. And to do that, I am going to copy this, right? Uh, let's see, how do we say it? PB prime, if we're going back to geometry. And from here, I'm gonna rotate out to create the angle. Let me show it in practice before we get too far into it. So I have PB is given, and it's saying make uh, BPA. So I'm going to rotate from my given to here create my second ray, and then I'm going to mark that A. Now I have BPA constructed here, 
very lazy construction, right? It's more to prove of, talk about this point. Notice that I showed this directional change, right? This is, and this is where we're gonna talk about positive versus negative rotation. This is some degrees or some radian measure theta. We don't know what it is yet. That's not the thing. What I wanna talk about is as we have PB, that's gonna be our initial side. That's where we started and we're rotating PA away from it. It's just like opening a door. If you had me in geometry, every day that we talked about angles, I stood at that door to express, you know, as the door opens more, the angle changes or the linear pairs are always tied together to be angled to 180 when they sum up. But for here, I just wanna talk about this. In this case, because I'm moving away from PB, this is my initial side. And PA, right, is where I stopped. Terminal is another word for stop. So when my rotation stopped from PB, it created an angle theta by moving away from PB. So that's my initial side, and that's my terminal side. Now, the question becomes, which one of these is correct? Well, it depends. Where do we start from? If I had originally had PB and I rotated it in this direction, then I am going clockwise in my rotation. And a clockwise rotation is always negative. And the counter or anti-clockwise rotation is positive. And I'll talk to you about why that is in just a second. Let me show you what a, well, first off, let me just express once again, that going from here to here, from my initial side to my terminal side, this is a negative rotation. And if I ever forget that, I'm gonna look up at the clock, right? We take away so much during your standardized tests and stuff and your finals and midterms, all the posters are gone. The clock is always going to be there. And if I ever panic, I'm gonna look at the clock for just five seconds. And I can see the direction in which the second hand is changing. And that's gonna tell me that's clockwise rotation and it's negative. Counterclockwise would be if I started at PA, let me get a slightly different color. And I moved, this was my initial side and I went here, my rotation then would be positive because it's going the opposite direction of my second, even minute and hour hand on the clock. So why not have positive rotation follow the clock? Then we could just look at it and not run into that. Well, in geometry, we got away so much from graphing and we were really just doing those proofs and all of that, that we kind of may have let this slip into the back of our minds. But if you're given a graph, and we're gonna do so much graphing in this class that we really need to get back to it. If I ask you to label the quadrants, notice the fashion in which they are labeled. And it's a little bit easier to see here, if I go back to that different blue. Oh, I have a red available, which is the one color I lost. Whenever I talk about these, the x-axis that's positive, so let's say the positive x-axis, so that's everything to the right of the y-axis that still exists on the x-axis, is my initial side. And from there, I can rotate in a positive, right? Positive would be going from quadrant one to two, to three, to four. And a negative rotation would be going, well, the opposite way, right? Clockwise. So if I start at one and I go this way, this is negative. And this one is positive. So the quadrants and the way we label them existed way before we had our analog clock. So history wins out on this one. 
And it is now counterintuitive to us because we're used to looking at the clock and reading it, but we have to go with history and remember that clockwise is a negative rotation. All right. So we have covered ray, angle, initial side, terminal side. That's where we stop our movement. We have our standard position, and that's why I wanted to bring this up. The standard position is when I find my eraser. There it is. This is so much easier when you get to sit at the computer because now everyone who's never actually sat in my class gets to see how often I lose, well, everything. So here, standard position, and this is laying the foundation for our unit circle, is when the starting point or the initial point of all of our rays are at the origin. So or the vertex is at zero, zero. And what's really nice about that is we can add a few definitions as this chapter and this class progresses, and we can eventually draw our unit circle and solve for everything rather quickly. But a standard position is just where our two rays are generated from a point about the origin, and typically, if not by definition, the x-axis that's positive is our initial side. Oh, those just mix together so nicely. Now, where's our terminal side? Oh, this is where the class really starts to ramp up and come into its own. I can have a positive rotation, I can have a negative rotation. I can do a bunch of rigid motion transformations here and have all of these cancel out, add up. Remember, the repeated comp composition of rigid motion transformations really could just always be summed up in one of the other rigid motion transformations. Uh, five rotations, you can just add those up, positive, negative, to get the overall rotation. If you have a reflection, translation, or reflection and a rotation, that can just be summed up in a glide reflection. So we can always make these easier, but let's start with some pretty basic cases. How many colors do I have available? I have a black and a green. Okay. So a couple things. Obviously, these lines, when we first learned about graphing, were defined to be perpendicular. So every quadrant is encompassing 90 degrees. So some very simple math, 90 degrees times four quadrants means we have 360 degrees. So if I were to tell you, pick any point on my blue line or my initial side, and then travel either direction in a positive or a negative rotation, how many degrees would you have to walk to get back where you started? Well. 360. So we'll get a little bit more into what that means in just a moment, but let's look at some of these here. Let's say that I want to graph point P to be about the origin, 45 degrees. So we're gonna rate, rotate a positive 45 degree, rotate 45 degrees, the point P at the origin. And I'm gonna condense this down so we don't have to keep writing all of this, but we are going to, let's just make a rule for this class. If this is absent, then it's understood that we're rotating around the origin. So this is the same thing. Around the origin, rotate negative 45 degrees Q, and probably should have done that in a different color, but now we just get a bonus example. Um, let's do, Let's do a couple of these first so we're not just watching me write forever. So rotate point P about the origin, 45 degrees positive means, 
Well, first, define point P anywhere along this line. I'm going to assign it right here, P, and I'm going to say that this is at the point 1, 0. Two easy numbers to work with. Also, as we progress, this point's going to be a very important point. So, if I take P and I rotate it 45 degrees positive, I know that I need to go in this direction. And I do have my protractor here, but let's just do this kind of conceptually. We know that 45 degrees would be half of 90. So let's just say that if I were to have this on my line and I rotated it up, it's going to roughly be right here. That's P prime, right? I've rotated it roughly 45 degrees. I guess we could make it slightly more accurate to be P prime. Now, my second rotation says for Q, rotate it about the origin, negative 45 degrees. That's going to be right about here. And the difference being, for positive, I went counterclockwise. And for negative, I went clockwise. We're also going to call this one Q. Now for R in green, which I've both put on the board, it says to rotate R 181 degrees. So I know if I start here, to go this direction is 90 degrees. No, another 90 is 180. So this is going to be one degree off of 180. So it's going to be a very small amount. Let's call this R. So why did I choose 181? I just wanted you to see that 90, 180, slightly past. Now R270, pretty easy. 90, 180, 270. I'm not even going to do much more there. This is now S prime. Knowing that this is at the point 10, this would be R and S as well. If I were to rotate this 90 degrees, if we follow our rules of rotation, this is just going to be 0, 1. If I do it another 90 degrees, this is going to be negative 1, 0. Just following over and over again the rules of rotation for any point that we learned in geometry. Now, if I go to 270, my S prime is going to be at 0, negative 1. These are key values for this class. And on those, that will always be, we're going to start by defining or point out 1, 0, and we're going to slowly turn around here. Now, no secret at all, especially with this Q, that I'm not the best person at not only graphing freehand, but doing pretty much anything. So I'm going to use this as an aid instead of accurate measurement. If I were to put this here, we know that this is a straight edge or 180 degrees. And you can see that I've missed my mark on this scale. But roughly, when I do this, what shape am I tracing out if I were to have asked you to do this for everything? If I said rotate 1 degree, 2 degree, 3 degree, 4 degree, 5, all the way around, we're going to be tracing out a circle. And that's leading us into what we call our unit circle. By definition, the radius of this circle is 1. Maybe not the best thing ever to you guys just yet. Maybe it's not completely true. But when we talk about the unit circle, there's a couple really special angles that we're going to talk about. And hopefully, a lot of these will jog your memory from geometry. And if they don't, that might not be the best thing ever. But 
we have some special triangles to talk about. If this is 30 degrees, so let's see, if I drop an altitude here, this would make a right triangle. If this is 30 degrees, this is 60 degrees, and that's 90 degrees. There's a couple things there that we can say based off of our 30, 60, 90 special triangle. And all I'm going to do is just slide this over here. And I'm going to do this rather quickly because this is coming up. I believe we're going 4, 1, 4, 3, 4, 2. So this is going to be a 4, 3 topic. But let me recreate this or let me translate this over to here. And the reason I wanted to say that the radius is defined as 1 here is the radius is the hypotenuse. So if this is 1 and we know the rules and we know the rules of a 30, 60, 90, we can follow those rules to determine the other side. I know that this is twice the length, the hypotenuse is twice the length of the side opposite of 30. So this is just 1 half. And now that I know what s is equal to, the side opposite of 60 is just s times the square root of 3. So right now, we have 1 half and the square root of 3 over 2. Now here's something that is somewhat interesting and kind of how we're going to proceed for the rest of the year on answering these questions. <laughs> okay, so if we were to think about translating this back to here, this is the y value for this, this is the x value, and of course this is the radius of the circle. And what comes out of all of this, and this is later on in the chapter, is we can start assigning some of these values as Sine is always going to be equal to y over r. Cosine is always equal to x over r. And not to go too far into it, but if this is opposite, and this is the hypotenuse, then by definition, sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse, which gives me the square root of 3 over 2 over 1. And that is our sine value. So that's really what the unit circle is going to do for us. There are, uh, let's see, three values in each quadrant that we have to memorize. So there's already 12 there. You need to know the four defined 1, 0, 0, 1, negative 1, 0, and 0, negative 1. And you need to know all of these, not only. All right, let's talk about our learning targets before we get too much further in. You have three of them today. Uh, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to convert between radian and degree measure. That's what we're going to jump into next after our kind of overall preview of chapter four that we just finished. Your second learning target. I can use the relations between the radius, angle, and arc length. So we're going to revisit that from geometry. And I can find the angles that are coterminal with other angles. Probably the easiest part of today's lesson. So we know we like to use degrees but we're getting away from that. I kind of gave you that heads up in geometry that once you get to pre-calc, you'll use degrees for a little while, but we're gonna focus on radians, even though we didn't do too much with radians in geometry, but it is the way forward from here on out. And kind of usually I like to just start with a refresh of our Cartesian plane, but we've done that, right? Uh, like this is quadrant one, two, three, four. And we kind of use that to show where our positive rotation comes from. So what we're going to kind of talk about now is the angle between the initial and terminal sides can also be measured in radians. So let's revisit this one more time. We said to travel from here to here is 90 degrees. And then if we pick up on that, this is 180. And if we continue on that, this is gonna be 270. We're just adding 90 each time. 
And we can continue from here. And this is kind of where we get the idea of coterminal angles. And that just means two angles that land on the same spot and have the same initial site. So if I were to go all the way around and hit 360, if I went an additional 90, and I'm changing colors here because I've gone all the way around, this would also be 450 degrees. And if I were to continue, this is 540 degrees. Add another 90. This one's throwing me off. Feels wrong. 630 degrees. And then continue around and we've completed our second circle and we're now at 720 degrees. So, because this is my given initial side in this class that we're always gonna work from, right? For all of these angles, All of these measurements were derived from starting at this initial side and going in a positive rotation. Now, to determine if angles are coterminal, it's actually really easy. You can do, let's take, let's do 270 and 630. And historically, when I was an intern in the room next door, uh, this, not this lesson, Actually, it was this lesson, but he did it in a slightly different order. The first time I ever taught this in radians, I made a huge mistake here. And it was a really good learning experience for me because he very nicely corrected me. So as you get used to it, even when you've been using it for years, every once in a while you make a mistake. But let's try and put my mind to ease here. And I'm gonna ask, is 630 degrees co-terminal to 270 degrees. And what I can do here is recognize immediately that this is greater than 360. So I'm gonna subtract 360, and I'm gonna keep subtracting 360 until my measure is between, so my measure needs to be greater than zero. Let's do it this way. The measure of my angle needs to be greater than zero degrees, but it also must be less than 360. And what that says here on the circle is basically, if this is my initial side, as I rotate, I need my terminal side to be found before I get back to my initial side. Once I cross over, I can just pull out 360 degrees until I am in that compound inequality and it's satisfied. So I know I'm going to make it at least once around because this is greater than 360. So is 630 minus 360 a solution to this inequality? And if it is, then I can judge whether or not these are co-terminal. This is looking pretty good. 270 is a solution here because 270 is greater than zero, but it's also less than 360. Now I can say from my initial side, if I travel 270 degrees around, where will I end up? Well, right here at this point. So in fact, 270 and 630 are both co-terminal, meaning they start at the same initial side and they have the same terminal side. All right, let's look at these three. Pause the video, give it a try. My question to you is, are these given degrees coterminal? Is zero degrees coterminal with 540 degrees? Is 45 degrees coterminal with 315 degrees? And is 45 degrees coterminal with 405 degrees? To start, we're going to build our coordinate plane. And again, pause the video, just try and get these three answers. Um, and then I'll do them for you in just a second. <laughs> Welcome back. So zero degrees means on my initial side, let's go ahead and label that. If I rotate zero degrees, which is neither positive nor negative, I'm not going anywhere. So this is zero degrees. And then 540 is in between zero 
and 360. So I'm going to subtract 180 from it. Two seventy can't be two seventy. What well, is five forty? It's three sixty and one eighty. So three hundred and sixty degrees. Well, here's my initial side. I've now traveled ninety, one eighty, two seventy, three sixty. These are in fact co-terminal. Remember, this needs to be in standard position, right? And then you're saying, well, there's nothing here. What I'm doing is here's my initial side, right? That is my ray for now. We'll turn into a line segment later. Then this line segment is rotating along this 360 degrees to end up right back where we started. Let's try the 45 315. And what I'm gonna say there is on first glance, I can see the sum of those is going to be 360. So I might jump in and just say, yeah, these are closed terminal. But let's look at it. So here's my initial sign. Let's go ahead and make this a line segment of length one. And let's rotate it a positive 45 degrees. So that's really going to be right here. Right, kind of splits the quadrant in half. And then our next one says to go 315 degrees. So initial side, here's 90, here's 180, here's 270. And then I need 45 more. And if we look at this again, 315 already satisfies this compound inequality. So it already didn't have a value like that, co-terminal. Now, if I go back and slightly modify this problem to say negative 45, then this is going to be from here to here. And those are in fact co-terminal. And what's nice here is you can think of this as the magnitude or the amount it's traveled. And you can just say 315 minus, right, for the magnitude. since I'm going in the opposite direction of positive or with the clock, which is negative, negative 45. And those would add up to 360, showing that they are in fact co-terminal. So positive 45 does not work. And this kind of follows through for the same thing. Again, this is 45. 405 is just 400. Does not fit into here as a solution. So let's subtract 360. 45 does satisfy this. So I would just go 45 degrees. So these are in fact co-terminal. And this one is not co-terminal. All right.
here again, this is our arc length. And this is our radius. So, another vocab that we might want to revisit from geometry is what is a central angle? Well, a central angle, if I have a circle, I'm going to define this as circle P. Remember, this means the circle with center P. A central angle starts at the center of the circle. It has two line segments that extend to the circumference. It doesn't fall short of the circumference, it does not pass the circumference. So here we have now, let's call this A and B. So now we have a central angle A, P, B. Right now we can go in either direction. Just make sure again that our vertex, which is at the center of the circle, is in the middle of the way we describe this angle. So the arc length, or my S, is what's between A and B. Any real number. 
Let's change this from five. And let's say that this is the length x, where x is a real number. And then for any x here, this becomes x, x, x. And then I would have the same set of x over x, which divides out always the same value and the real numbers to be one. So for any case there, that's going to work to be one reading when we set it up that way. Okay. So now the question becomes, how do we, how would we describe a theta such that it goes from, well, my x axis at one zero, all the way around. How many radians would we get out of that? And that one may not be the easiest one to conceptualize. So let's draw this. Let's go ahead and put a coordinate plane on here. And this is kind of us working right towards our unit circle and what we're going to be doing. So that's a little exercise to decide. So let's say that I have a point right here. And I generate an angle, or yeah, an angle, where this is my initial side and my terminal side. Everyone watching this video will tell me I travel 360 degrees, right? A full circle, 360 degrees. But how many radians did I travel? Well, one nice thing about this approach is. Since I'm defining this radius to be a set length, which is just the definition of it, as this rotates around, it will trace the circumference. And I know that I can find the circumference of any circle with this right here. The circumference of any circle is 2 times pi times the radius. And you guys have been doing that. here for our EDA. If I were to just find my initial point as A this time and B for my terminal, I've done the entire circle. So my circumference was traced, meaning this is also equal to my arc length of an entire circle. And we can now see that the arc length of a full rotation of 360 degrees is also equal to two times pi times r. And the reason why, when we get a little bit more in depth with the unit circle, we're going to say that the radius will always, for the unit circle, r will always equal one. And that's gonna be really nice because anywhere from here, from the origins in my initial point is one. From here, even at 45 degrees, my radius is still going to be one. It doesn't matter if I pick any point from the origin to the circumference will always be one. What's nice about that is here, if I come back and make this substitution, I'll have two times pi times one. And when we have our multiplication identity there, what is gonna happen? Well, I can drop that out just for the unit circle. And say that the circumference is equal to two pi. That is a true statement there. That's still also equal to the arc length. So now we know that a full rotation is too high. So this leads us into our second learning target today is how would I be able to show that two pi is equal to 360 degrees or how would I show 360 degrees is equal to two pi? Also from this, and let's erase a little bit of this information, Let's start here. This is going to be in degrees in blue, and let's go green for radians. This is going to be zero degrees. We know this is 90 degrees. We know this is 180 degrees. And we know this is 270 degrees. So let's get some of butter out of the way. I think for our sake, we probably could make a few in 
intuitive leaps here before we really get into this. Zero degrees is going to be equal well, to zero radians, right? I haven't moved. So if that is the case, I'm at zero movement or zero radians moved. I guess technically we should write this as zero times two pi. Let's actually do that just without much experience here. So my question then becomes, let's skip 90 degrees now. It may not be the most obvious way to approach this. What if I were to go 180 degrees? This is still my initial side. I've traveled half of the circle. This is going to be 2 pi over 2. And that's going to cancel out to mean that pi and 180 degrees are the same. So when we go to prove or we can start working on how to convert these, it's pretty safe to say that we should find pi and 180 degrees that are equivalent, just the difference is degrees versus radians. And now, with this little bit of information, we should be able to see that we can find these two. From zero to pi, 90 degrees is the middle of this semicircle. So if this is pi and we're halfway there, this is going to leave us at pi halves. And here's where I made that mistake I talked about earlier when I was an intern, and this was that first lesson I ever got in front of a class to teach. And what I did in my mind is I said this is three quarters of when I said this is three pi quarters. But if you think about that, three pi quarters is only 0.75 pi, which would put a somewhere between pi halves and a whole pi. This is always going to be over two, just because we are looking at the semicircle halves, but as a whole, it's a quarter, but this is going to be three pi halves. And it makes a little bit more sense if you think about it as zero pi, 0.5 pi, pi, 1.5 pi, two pi. And we're never gonna write on this that. We're always gonna have them in this fraction form when we're dealing with radians with pi in the numerator. But it is a nice way at first, zero pi, 0.5 pi, 1 pi, 1.5 pi, 2 pi, just to get into that habit of mind of uh, thinking of this way. Because we do have pi 6 coming up, we have pi 4 coming up, we have pi 3 coming up. So it's kind of just getting into our mind that we have pi naps, 3 pi naps there is a good way to start motor this. So let's think about this right here. I want to convert 180 degrees into radians. And I know that radians always have pi in the numerator. So I'm going to use the form pi over 180 and multiply that by degree, the degrees that I'm looking for to see what the output is in radians. So 180 is the same as 180 over 1. Now I'm going to multiply that by pi over 180. Now, in geometry, we would spend all the time to multiply this through. You get 180 pi over 180, but we know that multiplication, these are going to group together, these are going to group together, and then this bar means divide. 180 divided by 180 is 1. Pi divided by 1 is pi. And I want to do this again, but this time I want to do 90 degrees since we are expecting the denominator. Again, we don't know this yet, but we're going to see if we can do it. So, I'm going to go ahead and remind myself to multiply whatever degree I'm trying to convert. So 90 degrees times pi over 180. Again, 90 over 1. I can divide both of these by 90, leaving me with 1 and 2. 1 times pi is pi. 1 times 2 is 2 and we get exactly what we expected. Uh, let's do this. Verify this one on your own. Pause the video for just a second. Make sure you get the conversion rate, and then I'll do it here. 360 times pi over 180. 360 is divisible by 180, leaving with 2 over 1. Pi over 1 is pi. And I still have this 2 out here, so I'm left with 
to pi. So we've got 90, we need 270 zero left. Let's go with zero. That one actually seems kind of interesting. But does it, right? Zero times any amount is gonna be zero. Why did I write the pi here? Just so that we know that we're talking radians on this side. That's it. Zero pi is equivalent to this zero that we just found. Zero here represents zero movement from the initial side. The initial and terminal side are at the exact same location, or it's just a line that is represented by the positive x axis. All right, let's do 270, but I have room here. 270 times pi over 180. Not divisible by 270 for both, or 180, because they're both divisible by 9, 290 actually. This is gonna leave me with three, and this is going to leave me with two. Three times pi is three pi, and of course this was over one, so I am left with three pi x. Now, degrees times pi over 180 gives me the radiance, and it's probably not too much of a secret, but I gave you a reciprocal here for a reason. And this time, instead of having pi over 180 as my multiply by one, I'm gonna multiply by one with 180 over pi. So let's do this one, two degrees, right? Pi half, I don't know my degrees now, so I'm gonna do 180 over pi to see what that solves for. Pi divided by pi is one, 180 divided by two, is 90, and this leaves me with 90 degrees. Again here, and if you notice, when I'm working in my radians, or I'm sorry, when I have degrees, I have my radians in the numerator, or my pi in the numerator for radians, and 180 in the bottom. It's always the reciprocal. 90 degrees by 180, because I'm converting to degrees, is in the denominator. Here, I'm already given pi, so pi goes my denominator. And it'll always be because we want them to cross cancel. Let's try this one. This one is 180 over pi. This is pi over one. These are getting canceled, leaving me with 180 degrees. This one, I can go ahead and cross cancel these and I'll get 90. Three times 90 is 270. Pi divided by pi is one, leaving me with 270 degrees. And one last one here. Right? This is two pi over one. These cancel, leaving me with one here. And now I have 180 times two with 360 degrees being my answer. So let's try this one. How do we convert 30 degrees to radians? So again, that's using this over here. My degrees times pi over 180. And you spread for that, right? Degrees to pi, yep. So it's 30 degrees times pi over 180. Here, 30 and 80 are divisible by each other. Well, by 30, I should say, it's simplified. 30 and this will be six. So 30 degrees is equivalent to pi over six. Uh, let's do 45. This is a lot of repetition. Just remember for degrees, again, pi is in the numerator. And from radians to degrees, pi is the denominator. You always want pi in its opposite position of where it would be for radians. 45 pi over 180. And I did that because this is the long way that I said you don't want to do, but we might as well show it to you. And then we can see that 180 is both divisible by 45, and 45 is divisible by 45. This would be 1. 45 twice is 90. 90 twice is 180. So this is just pi over 4. And then we have left 60 times pi over 
180. This one's really easy, 130. 1 third, right? 16 to 183, 16 to 60 is 1. Never say it's easy until after you, you have it made a full result. So that's that. What I want you to do for your participation is convert these answers back into degrees to show that you have understood how to do this. And I want you to also throw, uh, let's do 5 by thirds into degrees for your participation. And you're just gonna turn that into me on Friday so that I know you watched the video. And this is target two, converting degrees to radians and radians to degrees. Let's find coterminal angles in degrees and in radians now that we have some background information. Remember the circle. One or one, let's call it one repetition for now. Okay, it's 360 degrees or two pi radians. And that's important because this means our coterminal angle and our term coterminal angle, sorry, our initial angle and our coterminal angle are at the same point, one comma, zero. So remember, I want my radius to be one, so I'm gonna go out one unit, and then I'm gonna spin it. So, for zero degrees, what is a coterminal angle and a positive rotation? So if I start at one zero, I'm gonna to have to travel 360 degrees. I could travel a second time around and be at 720 degrees. For zero, it's the easiest one. It's just suited green. So we can talk about the generalized form here. But this one is just 360, one full revolution, times n for the number of revolutions at one. So if I wanted the fifth coterminal angle, I would just do 360 times five, which would be 1800. And I could also include now 1800 degrees. Now, I'm going to negative rotation. Starting at 1, 0. I'm going to go clockwise until I get there. So, it's going to look very similar. And now we're going to be going negative 360, negative 720, negative 1060, 1080, sorry. So this is going to be negative 360 degrees. Negative 700. Sarah, then we can just say that it's just negative 360 times n to find any co-terminal angle there. Now in radians, kind of the same thing, right? If I'm going in a positive rotation, my blue rotation here, I'm starting at 0 pi. Now I'm going to keep writing 0 pi even though we know it's equal to 0. And once I get around, it's going to be 2 pi and then 4 pi. 6 pi, 8 pi. All of these are coterminal with each other. So it's just really, well, let's put it all the way out first. So we have in blue, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, and this should be Here, it's just going to be 2 times, well, let's do n times 2 pi. n times 2 pi, where n is the number of rotations that you want. Now let's talk about in a negative rotation, or clockwise, where I have a green here. If I go this way, I've got 0 pi. Or sorry, I started at 0 pi, but one full rotation gives me negative two pi, negative four pi, negative six pi, negative eight pi. So it's gonna be the same resulting thing, except for it's gonna be the number of rotations that I want times negative two pi for that first complete clockwise turn. And you're gonna see the fall, and this is pretty simple, right? It's just negative two when n is one, when n is two, I get negative four. When n is three, I get negative Six, etc. Now let's try it. Let's 
slightly more difficult way, but it's not really right. Because now I can convert this back to degrees, and we're so comfortable with degrees from geometry and well, everything else, that if I know what the degree measurement is, and here I know it's going to be pi on the bottom, because I have pi on the numerator at 180, these will cancel. And I'm left with 180 over 4. For some reason, I'm drawing a blank on that, so let's see. This will go in 4 times for 20 left over. So 45 degrees. So all I have to do here is, well, let me erase this so I can draw 45 degrees on this and make a little more sense. Here's my plane. This is roughly 45 degrees. I'm gonna go ahead and mark the magnitude or the length of this. Uh, line segment to be one because we really want to never forget that. Now, if I start here and I want to go positive first or counterclockwise, and I go from here all the way to here, I've traveled 360 degrees. So this would be a co terminal angle. So really, if I just say I've added 360 degrees to this and I get 400. So, we have four and five. Go ahead and just kind of generalize this and see that every time we're just adding 360, so this will be seven, six, five. And that's really it. What we're doing is we're adding 360 every time if it's a positive rotation. And if it's a negative rotation, we're subtracting 360 every time. So now, let's go in that negative or clockwise rotation. And now we can see that we started at 45 degrees and we've gone in a negative 360. That leaves me with 315 degrees. And now I can just keep subtracting 360 from that. Cute back there, there, right? So, really what we're going to do here to generalize these is we're going to take our 45 degrees that we started with and add 360 times the number of complete rotations that you want. And here we're just going to take 45 and minus 360 times the number of rotations. So if I ask you if I were to go in a negative rotation or clockwise rotation 12 times what would my co-terminal angle be? It'll just be 360 times 12, whatever that product is. Take 45 minus that product, and you'll know the co-terminal angle just like that. Here, it's kind of the same thing for radians again. It's just pi fourths plus two pi, and pi fourths minus two pi. So let me put the general form first. Positive rotation. Positive rotations in blue. So we're going to start with pi force. And we're going positive rotation. So we're going to do plus. Yeah. Positive pi force plus 2 pi. And instead of doing this because everyone else had it, well, let's do it once. We have pi force plus. Now, I need my denominators to be the same. So this is two over one, which means I need to multiply this by four, so this is gonna be eight pi. And now we get nine pi four. Now, the reason I went ahead and did is, look at this answer right here, eight pi. Would that not be generated by this function when n is four? Meaning, this is our four complete revolution, and we just now need to tack on Right, this. So 9 pi fourths is our one complete revolution from there. So instead of doing that over and over, we're just going to say for any case here, it's pi over 4, which was my given radian measure, plus n times 2 pi, and pi fourths minus n times 2 pi.
fill out the 75 form. You can kind of follow this same structure. You know what, I'll do positive degrees and I'll do positive radians for you. All right, well, because I want you to convert it. That's gonna be part of my participation chip. So 75 in a positive rotation is just going to be my starting angle of 75 degrees. And every time I travel a full 360, I will have a coterminal angle for any number of revolutions. Fill this out. And also for this one, when n equals three, what will be the value in a pot? What will be the angle measure, the coterminal angle for each of these four columns? And radians, this is going to be whatever 75 degrees is as a radian plus n times two pi. This was on the same participation sheet that you turned in on Friday to show me you did the video. All right, guys, for our last piece of this video, the last thing to do before we start our homework, wrap up the participation, is let's go back to geometry and just find the arc plane really quickly and have a little bit of evidence that we can still do that. So what I'm gonna do first is just break this down to what we're looking at. S is my arc plane. That is, between, that is the intersected arc between the two radii that I have. So from here, to here is S. The radius, which is part of the one that we can skip forward on, is anything that starts at the center of the circle and ends on the circumference. So those are both R. And theta is the angle that if this is my initial side, this swings up to to be my terminal side, and what this traces is my R. So we know here, that the arc length is just equal to theta times r. And if you remember in geometry when we did this with degrees, so it was a little bit more complicated, n over 360 times r. But let's get away from that. This is easier, this is nicer. And let's see what happens here. Let's say that our given is theta equals pi fourths for all. Uh, examples. So let's not play too much with our theta. And example one, r equals three. Um, example two, r equals 16. Example three, r equals one. And let's play with that to find the arc length of each of these. So my theta is given for all three examples by fourths. So I can go ahead and write, start solving for this. And what I'm looking for is what is my arc length? So let me get my red, black, and blue, and until the end. So given pi fourths for this one, S equal to theta, which is in black, or pi fourths, times my radius, and for this one, it's three. So S is equal to three pi fourths. This is coming back to haunt me. This is exactly the answer that I gave years ago for 270 degrees conversion going around the Union circle. So I guess it just, subconsciously is always going to haunt me. Here, my arc length is equal to theta again, so pi fourths times my radius of 16. So, this one I chose because, unlike this one, this one was intentional, 16 times pi, over four, it's just four, pi. This means, no, it doesn't mean that. Well, no. On the unit circle, this would be a complete circle. This is not on this one. That's a really good thing. This is only pi fourth degrees, which would be 45, 45. So 
this is where it gets a little tricky here, and this is why we have to define the unit circle with radius one. When the radius is 16, pi four looks like two full revolutions, but it's not. It's just a circle with a central angle of 45 degrees with a 16 unit radius. Make sure when you're saying this, before you say this is a full revolution, you may verify that your radius is one. And here, S is equal to pi fourths times one. So here I just get pi fourths. And this is my unit circle. So now I know pi fourths again. Nice little way to round it up. Uh, what I want you to do is example three and four here, five and six. And this goes under anticipation as well. Let's say here that R is equal to 13, R is equal to 12, and R is equal to Make sure that question 120 is on its own sheet of paper. If you need copy paper, there's plenty on my desk. I'll leave a note on Thursday that you may grab some because I want this to be a nice piece for your notes that you can just add to reference because you're going to make your own unit circle with all of the measurements on it. And I want to make sure you have it to reference. And I told this to block five yesterday when the power, when the power in the classroom was out when our room was approaching 80 degrees. All quarter until everyone has a C or higher on this, we're going to continually retake the unit circle quiz until everyone scores at least a 70 on it. That means in week two, you take the first quiz. Everyone scores a 70 on it, we don't have to take that quiz again. If five people score below a 70 on it, the entire class takes it again. And the nice thing is, you let's say you get a 50 on the as you get a 90 on the first one, as long as you score 90 or higher, your grade's still gonna increase. But what I'm gonna do for you guys that score really well the first time, is I'll make that your floor level, as long as you score above a 50 on the subsequent one. So really quickly, let's say on quiz one, you score a 90. When you take it a second time, maybe you score an 80, well, in heads me, I'm going to keep this grade here. But to kind of incentivize you to keep studying, make sure you know it, if your score goes below 70, that's what goes into head. So you're safe here as long as you keep passing the quiz. And we'll keep doing this until every single person in the class has passed the test with a 70 or better. Now, if on the first quiz you get a 50, and on the second quiz, get an 80 and we have to take a third quiz and you get a 70 I will still honor this and keep that score as long as you continue to pass you'll keep running your higher score but if we do this this will go in as an 80 but if quiz 4 is a 20 then that's what goes in so you'll have a 50 an 80 a 70 and a 20 on quizzes in the group this is just foundational to the class and you need to know the You need to know the degree measure that are important on the unit circle. You need to know the radian measure and the x, y coordinates. And that's why I keep stressing my initial size is always up to one zero. So let's think really quick how many of those you need. In each quadrant, there's three special numbers 30, 45, and 60 degrees. So you need to know 30, 45, and 60 degrees. And you also need to know the radian measure and their x, y coordinates times four, that's 12, plus the four uh, axis lines, that's 16, times three is 48. So there'll be 48 things you have to memorize for your quizzes. And we're gonna keep taking these, and we'll push it into quarter three if we have to. Some of you are gonna do well on these, and you're gonna realize really quickly that this is your cushion 
for quarter two and potentially quarter three, where you're gonna keep doing well in these quizzes, and it's gonna pad your grade, or not, but pad's not the right word, right, because you earned the grade, but what it's gonna do is on test days, you're gonna have so much extra in that uh, calculation of your grade average, that that's gonna cushion you from a bad test grade way more than it would if we're not doing well on the quizzes over and over again.